these guys survived the David Kahn era of Timberwolves basketball and live to tell about it. It's Flagrant Howls. All right, welcome in. We got the sports dad, Judd Zolgad here, Flagrant Howls, a Timberwolves lifestyle podcast. Thank you guys for making Flagrant Howls a top 30 NBA podcast on Apple over the weekend. Nice. Or more importantly, thank you, Alex Rodriguez, Mark Laurie, and Glenn Taylor for just slinging mud at each other for 72 hours across multiple platforms. Hey, you know what? We'll take we'll take anything that we can get that's controversy. It's always good for business. Uh, it is, yeah. So if, if billionaires can just continue to you know, just lob fight. shots at each other. We'll keep talking about it, but it turned to basketball last night. You were inside Target Center, and so once again, it was so wildly popular last week, Judd's Wolves observations, Judd's Wolves thoughts, that we're going to turn the floor over to you here. I'll be at the game tomorrow night. You were there last night. Yep. Um, Glenn Taylor was there. Judd yep. Zolgad was there. Yep. Yep. You weren't barred from the A Rod. A Rod not there. Mark Laurie, I did not see there. Becky and Glenn, courtside early in fact that that's an observation but i'm not going to start with that okay i want to start with what what happened on the hardwood let's do it yeah they lost last night after winning that game against denver on the road maybe the biggest emotional boost win of the season they come back home and uh the bulls win that game last night so kind of a want want a buzzkill but yeah what's your first observation my first observation is ant edwards and his recent shooting slump which i find to be interesting now first of all you know, just clarity. It's a long season. Guys go through shooting slumps. So this is not some unheard of, but I was doing some, I was doing some statistical and analysis digging on this. And I think I might have the cause now post game. Ant said, uh, last night he was nine for 20 from the field. Oh, for five on three pointers and post game. He said, I thought they were all, of course, going in my legs. If they were all short. So my legs were shot. But I say, au contraire, Ant, you're trying to make us look at something over here because it's the reason over there that your problem exists right now. The good news is this is something that will heal. So Ant, in the five games before Sunday, was shooting 42% from the field and 31%. So this is five games, 31% on three-pointers. Um. This is a decline from a 46% average from the field for the season. So down 46 to to 42 in a five-game sample size. And 37% down to 31 on threes. Those five games in which his shooting had slumped and then continued into a sixth game last night coincides with one thing. The dunk. The dunk over John Collins, in which yeah. he in which he is now listed on the injury report with a left middle finger dislocation and a sprain. And after one of his, I believe it was a three-pointer attempt at the first half last night, Phil. Um, as as you know, the press row or the press tables are on the left side of the court near the Wolves bench. So they're across from the, the Wolves bench, left side. And Ant, after an attempt, came down to play defense. And I was watching him and he started playing with the tape because his fingers are taped together. Yeah. Like a Ninja Turtle or something. Like a Ninja. Yes. <laughs> um, and he was playing with the tape. He ripped something off, threw it away. It wasn't the entire tape job. It was part of it. But my point is, I don't think this is his legs. I think this is his fingers. And I think that dislocation is causing what appears to, to be a slump. In other words, I don't think the slump is a real slump. I think the slump is directly tied to the fact that he can't use his left hand like he's used to because of the dunk over John Collins when his hand basically dislocated or his finger did on John Collins' face. I don't hate this theory, actually. I feel like it's a, you're a big Law & Order guy, so you know how to look Sports for the story within the story, right? Um, and it, 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 if it was a shooting hand, I think he'd be largely unable to play because you, how would you sort of handle and, right. and even like get a shot off? Right. Uh, but the fact that he can get shots off, but it, maybe they're just not completely dialed in does make some sense. And it's kind of plummeted because he was a little closer to 40% on the season from three point range. And his percentage has now dropped to 36% on the season, which is below last year's average. So it, it has kind of train wrecked his statistics a little bit. He's going to be fine. 
and oh yeah at some point it'll but heal. i'm saying i think that's why and and yes it, it's not his guide hand but it's still his hands and it yeah. still clearly is annoying him yeah and that's enough to throw to throw throw you off i mean and it's not like he's shooting terribly just for him it's a slump and, and to I his credit he, he he's why. he's found ways to get to the rim a little bit more frequently i mean you know, the last couple of games, he's like 0 for 13, I think, from three-point range, but he has still found a way to... Yeah. He's got that little Euro step that he's using more often now. I feel like it's... I think you're right, first of all, so bravo for uncovering this. Thank you. And being there and watching in person probably validated, but if it if in the short term it has caused him to get more creative and add more layers and a, a, a more honed Euro step, I wonder if, if this thing heals in a couple of weeks, maybe long term, it was a good thing because it it made him add more things to his bag. I don't know. Yeah. He is, he is so interesting to watch too, because there, there were periods of last night's game, especially early where I thought basketball wise, he was dialed in. I sent you a text, the behind the back pass to Conley, who clearly played mm -hmm. a role on, you know, Mike helped him out, but that was a freaking great play. And then I sent you a note. There was one defensive play. He turned the ball over one of six times, I think, that he did yeah, that last night. Bad. But on this play in particular, uh, the Bulls player that stole the ball should have had a layup. And Ant hustled back. So it's his mistake, but still, hustled back. And Phil, I'm telling you, he angled him off with his shoulder, and he dipped his shoulder into the player and brought his momentum, the opponent's momentum, to a complete stop. Yeah. So, like, instead of fouling him or instead of trying to keep up and go in with him, he literally cordoned him off because he was quicker and mm -hmm. didn't have the ball, and he stopped him with his shoulder. That was impressive. Second half, got out of control at times a little bit. There there was one play in particular where Nasri did end up knocking down a three, but Nas was open for, I would say, three seconds, and Ant couldn't decide what to do with the ball. And the first time that he saw Nas, Nas was wide open. There, there was mm -hmm. nothing... So it's weird. It's so interesting to go to games and watch him in person because you can sort of see the maturation continuing. And at times he does stuff where you're like, I can't believe that play. And at times it's like that play is, there are certain plays that are going to come along and become second nature, but he's still trying to improve himself in his, in his totality as a player. He is, yeah. If you compare now for, to a year ago, two years ago, his decision-making is so much more dialed. But you're right there, I think... You can sort of see him processing sometimes. Should I go get mine right now? Or should I go hit an open teammate that I trust kind of, but not as much as myself. Right. Um, but like last night, and I'm, I know they lost the game and we can get to the buzzkill nature of the game, but he was, he was still everywhere, man. Like he was, he was grabbing rebounds, key rebounds. Cause they had, there was a major rebounding deficit at one point. Yep. And, and he was finding open teammates. If that shot comes back around, if that finger heals on his non shooting hand, then it probably will. But yeah, I think your, I think your undercover work is spot Thank on there. Much. Detective the, Zolgad. Yes. And the game also is so fast. L like when you're close, you realize the decisions are like that. Like on TV, well, I feel like it's sort of with the angle, it sort of unfolds at like, Oh, that play is simple. It, it's like uh, watching hockey from the press box. Same thing. It's like, how did you not see that guy? And then you go down near the ice or the court, and it's like, oh, that's how you didn't see that guy. It's so. yeah, it's a bunch of seven footers in a small space. And I, maybe I'm stealing one of your observations, but Jim Pete on the broadcast devoted a chunk of he literally like brought up the film for a minute or two and showed how quickly Nas Reed makes decisions that hit like th there's a reason why the ball moves a lot better oftentimes when when Carl Anthony Towns isn't on the court. Yep. It doesn't mean the cat isn't still a wildly skilled player and a unicorn, but just the decision making and the speed that Nas Reed operates with, and he hasn't been great the last couple of games. He's in a little bit of a shooting slump too, but um, yeah, you uh, you saw it on display for chunks last night, and we can maybe talk about that too because Nas Reed has done the biggest turnaround in terms of what you can do with him in a lineup compared to last year versus this year. Definitely. So, anyways, uh, Judd's next observation okay. from last night. My next observation is this: Chris Finch is learning, and I thought that this was. In a loss in which, you know, there was a lot to debate about who did what wrong. Chris Finch had a brilliant night, but it was after the game. In his post-game press conference, Chris Finch was asked about the loss. And, I mean, this is a loss that you could have been pretty frustrated by. The team didn't shoot particularly well. The Bulls, I mean, 
Alex Caruso made his first four threes in the first quarter alone. Yeah. I think he made six of seven. But one of the things Chris Finch went out of his way to say was he took the blame for uh, for the Bulls getting off to such a great start shooting wise, and flat out said we had the wrong game plan. That's my fault. Things did improve when it got adjusted. And this to me is brilliant. This time of the year with a team like this, there are definitely times during the course of a season, and this Wolves team has deserved it, where Chris Finch has gotten pissed off. And and he's, you know, the Carl Anthony Towns, what, 60-point game was mm-hmm. an inexcusable loss. And he probably got more upset publicly than he wanted to. But I thought the pivot last night to sort of fall on the sword um, in knowing how to massage a team, in knowing how to get the most, in knowing how to be the bad cop at times, but you can't always be the bad cop. Whether Chris Finch truly thought that he did a bad job with the game plan or not, I thought it was an absolutely brilliant play because you're coming off that Denver win, which was incredibly impressive. There's no reason to hammer this team right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're contending for first place in the Western Conference. They're one of the best teams in the entire league. I don't think that you can honestly say at any point effort now has been a problem. Like they are working their butts off a lot. I thought Chris Finch's motives for falling on the sword, whether he believed it or not, that's the maturation, in my opinion, of a coach who wants to get the most from his team. Yeah, it, it did feel like he pushed the right buttons. I know a lot of people are furious about that loss, that, man, you come home, you're playing one of these weak Eastern Conference teams that's just fighting for the bottom of the plan. Chicago is without Zach Levine, obviously Lonzo Ball. They've got all these guys missing. They still have some – I mean, DeMar DeRozan is still one of the better players in the NBA. Yeah. But – I'll come on this podcast and hammer them when they need it. When I feel like this team needs some tough love from an idiot on a microphone, like I will get on this podcast and happily play that role. Last night, sometimes in the NBA, it really comes down to did one team hit shots and did the other team not? Hmm. And now, of course, there's the why. Why did a team hit shots versus not? It didn't feel to me like the Timberwolves were lacking energy or lacking fight or enthusiasm. I thought the entire game, I thought they were dialed in. They were playing their asses off. And at the end of the night, the Chicago Bulls shot just under 60% from three-point range, and the Wolves shot under 30% from three-point range. It's hard to make up that math when one team is knocking down 60%. By the way, the Bulls were shooting almost 70% from the field going into the fourth quarter yeah, for the were. game. It was, it was phenomenal. It's just insane. And you mentioned Alex Crusoe. So Alex Crusoe in his career averages making one three-pointer per game. This year, career high, it's one and a half. Mm-hmm. That dude knocked down seven threes last night. He was seven for eight from downtown. Yes. So, and I saw, I saw I, of course, I'm just picking out one random tweet, but, you know, I put out the tweet. You know what? Sometimes it's as simple as, Alex Crusoe hit seven threes in a game and you tip your cap and you go to the next one, right? Which is kind of what Anthony Edwards said. Mm -hmm. And uh, someone hit me back and said, Alex Crusoe hitting seven threes shouldn't have made the difference. The Wolves should have won this game. It's a bad loss. Well, a couple of things. It is a bad loss. (laughs) You don't want to lose a game at home to a sub 500 Eastern Conference team after the the emotional high victory over the Nuggets. But to dismiss Alex Caruso hitting seven threes as something you should just be able to overcome... Um, I don't know, man. Like, yeah, there's some things they probably could have done differently. If they had the wrong game plan, that's a problem, whatever. But, like, I didn't see anything in that game that raised a long-term red flag that makes me feel like, oh, now they have a lesser chance in a playoff series right. against whoever they play well, in the first round. Yeah, and guys are playing hurt, too. And and look, like, like we have, um, and Finch has, identified defeats during the course of this season that have been bad defeats. The I first he, Bulls loss was worse than this one, I oh, think. absolutely. Yeah, the, here's the thing that you said that I agree with completely being there. I didn't see a lack of effort. A lack of execution, yeah. Um, the Bulls get getting incredibly hot, yeah. But it, to me, it's more like, and I think it's pretty clear, when a team cashes it in and, and basically gets beat, that's very, to me, obvious. I don't think you saw that last night at yeah. all. And I, I don't eat, I don't eat, even think there was a quarter where the Wolves didn't try. And guys are playing hurt. Ant yeah. is hurt. Go, Gobert, I think Gobert is playing through rib, a rib injury 
that, not to name names, would keep some guys on this team out. I think it would keep a lot of guys out around a lot of teams. I think you're right. So, yeah. so I mean, Chris Finch, but but I think the important thing is know your team. Don't be tone deaf. Chris yeah. Finch is not. He's a smart guy. I love the fact that he basically stepped up and purposely caused questions about his coaching that took away the focus from his team because he knew this was not the time to bitch and moan publicly. Yeah. I will say, like, one thing that does feel a little bit red flag-ish, Jaden McDaniels has had a huge drop in three-point efficiency. This is, He was a 40% three-point shooter last year. And uh, he's now sitting at 34.5% this year, which, you know, on a night like last night where Anthony Edwards is clearly dealing with some discomfort in his non-shooting hand and it's throwing off this or that, like he goes, Jaden McDaniels goes one for six again from downtown. And most of these, he's generally not shooting a three unless it's a pretty open look. Yep. So the threes that he's missing, he he's going to get more open threes than Anthony Edwards because Anthony Edwards is sometimes taking hero ball threes because he's he can get those shots off. Right. So I would like to see Jaden McDaniels. I don't need you to lead the team in scoring, you know, once a week. I just knock down open threes. That's the biggest thing. You're, he's going to get like five or six open threes. Enough of these one for six performances. He's got to find a way to dial that in. And Finch did say um, probably accurately that he probably sh- uh, should have called more for Mike Conley late. Mike Conley was having a really good game. I think yeah, like the last three again. games, he's gotten incredibly hot. Yep, he's hot again. So, so hey, before we get to more Judd's observations from Target Center last night, a shout out to a couple of friends. One down the street from Target Center, Modest Brewing. There's a great nice. tap room in the North Loop for Minnesota sports fans. It's right down the street from Target Center and Target Field, which is uh, a place to be this time of year, too. Cans available in liquor stores throughout the metro and a new event space as well. So if, you know, if, you, if you're down for a game and they're home this week, uh, go check out maybe pregame Modest Brewing. But also, if you're planning for an event, it's a perfect. They have a brand new event space that holds parties between 40 and 120. So we're talking about corporate parties or happy hours, birthday parties, wedding stuff, um, you name it. There's a private entrance, a private bar. There's a fully tricked out AV setup, great view overlooking the brewery. You can find out more information about the private event space at modestbrewing.com and go check them out. Big Timberwolves fans over at Modest Brewing. Also speaking of Timberwolves fans, Our friend David at First Equity Mortgage has been a 20-year season ticket holder for Wolves and Lynx games, so you might even see him roaming around during this stretch run. And a few years ago, I had a great experience refinancing my home with David over at First Equity. Uh, They have great programs for veterans and for new home buyers as well if you qualify, and a great reputation just in general in the Twin Cities community and in the industry. You can find out more about First Equity and the great work they do at femort.com. That's femort.com or scornorth.com, keyword David. Okay. Observation number three. I promised it. Yes, that's right. Glenn Taylor and his wife, Becky, were not only at the game last night, courtside seats, of course, right by the Wolves bench, but they were there very early. Security guys sort of just keeping an eye out on things. Um, and, and I was, I, and I will fully admit part of the reason why I went was the ambulance chasing Judd loves to see if it's going to be a train wreck. So I was curious and, and, you know, don't, don't forget. I went a lot in, in the Tibbs Butler thing. And I mean, that crowd turned pretty toxic. Yeah. And those were pretty nice crowds. Like they did draw and that crowd got toxic. So, so the Minnesota sports fan is, you know, it's not Philadelphia, but they can get nasty. We'll get mad at you. Yeah. We'll, and you know, they booed to, you know. And coaching the Timberwolves, Tom Thibodeau, and a Ooh. boo. Um, so Glenn and Becky were sitting in their seats last night. Um, I did hear one fan, when the place was still pretty empty, yell, Glenn, sell the team. And I thought that might be the start of, oh, boy, we're going to get some chance. We're going to get some of this and that. No. Interesting. That building, uh, Glenn, he might as well have been named John Smith because he got, and it's not a bad thing, he got no attention. But what I did love was the place was packed again. Now, they still aren't selling certain seats in the upper deck, and I don't know when that's going to change, if that's going to be a playoff thing or not. Uh, But the place was packed. The place was jumping. And, I mean, that place is alive now. So there there was certainly an opportunity, if fans were upset with Glenn, to let Glenn know. Yeah. I did not hear a thing. And, of course, 
I did not see Mark, Lori, or Alex Rodriguez there. No, because they are not allowed in there, apparently. Anymore. Are they not allowed into the game? I still want to know what the rules are. And then Glenn said, Glenn told the Star Tribune that was BS, that they're just not allowed in that lounge. Well, they can. I'm sure they can buy tickets like anyone else. But Glenn is Glenn wants them separated from the team. He doesn't want them roaming so around. So their suite downstairs is just sits there locked. I guess because that used to be our room. I'd like to have it back for myself. Yeah, it's like a lounge yeah. with big TVs, marble floors. That's a hell of a press lounge now. Yeah, it sounds like. According to Mark and Alex, sounds like Glenn was sort of resentful that they even did that, right? Well, you that, know, some Wolves folks can can you be like, hey, if you guys aren't going to use this, because Glenn, it's a score north. It could be the flagrant house room. Yeah, yeah. Could, I mean, it, the, sounds, like actually, the, it sounds like the Dane Moore NBA podcast room might, might be. I saw Dane last night. I said, dude, you did a great job. Phenomenal, phenomenal job. It's a um, great get. But I would, you know, you know, I'm thinking because I mean, I got the house here. It's okay, but I'd be willing to move in, into a luxury suite room i mean i'll put a request in uh it it, it never hurts to ask right you I'm might not sure as well make room them for dawn, but I, I'll, I'll call her and stuff <laughs> i'm kind of surprised actually that maybe i'm just maybe i'm just tone deaf to what just based on the reaction to the mark and a rod well even going back to the glenn press release and then when when mark and a rod came out with their very strategic media blitz on friday it felt like 85 to 90% of the fan reaction that I was seeing was anti Glenn Taylor. Yes. And I thought that might spill over if he, but the fact that he showed up a little bit early too, cause he sometimes doesn't get out there until right before like pregame introductions. It's almost like he was marking his territory. No, that's what I thought. This is do. my team, my arena. But, I'm out here early. Who, who wants to, who yeah. wants to tell me otherwise? But I, no assumed, but I assumed, but I assumed that the upper deck, right, the cheaper seats might start chanting or something, and I and I didn't hear a thing. Are you surprised by that? A little bit. Yeah, I thought it would be. I'm not sure. I thought it'd be toxic, but I thought that there'd at least be some type of, you know, because to your point, we certainly saw a lot of pissed off people at Glenn Taylor. Yeah. And I don't, you know, to, to we're too show. passive aggressive Minnesotans, man. We're too but passive that's aggressive. The weird thing is, we weren't with Tibbs and Butler. <laughs> we got all mad there, and I don't know if this is because Glenn is one of us or what. But I just thought that there'd be some type of, you know, some brief type yeah. of flare up, spurt or something. Because you know, once a chant starts, ordinarily people will chime in. Didn't yeah. hear a thing. When do you think? And we're kind of we're kind of at the mercy of basically. I think it's up to Mark and A-Rod if they want to like challenge this, which they said that they will they will fight forever to right. keep their dream alive. They'll fight for years if they need to. Right. Now that both sides have done their grenade throwing very publicly, it feels like we're going to go into kind of a calmer behind the scenes period here. When do you think the next public airing of grievances will happen? Probably, I kind of feel probably, like it's done for now. Well, I feel like the lawyers, if the lawyers are smart, they're telling everyone to shut up. Just shut up. Yeah. It what does, are we like doing everyone's here? aired their <laughs> issue. And the public, like, I don't know that despite what Mark and A-Rod did, I don't know how much of this you, you want to continue to go frontal for. Yeah. Um, but here's the one thing. So here's where I think it sparks up next. We need to hear from the league. Yeah. Because if the league's like, well, you know what? Technically, Mark and Alex are right, but they don't have the money, in our opinion. Then it's dead. What, are you going to sue the league at that point for saying that you're broke? Because yeah. you're going to prove you're not broke. You know, so so I I think Adam Silver is sort of the next thing to drop because he can sort he could go a long way towards just blowing this whole thing up as far as it's right. being done. Because so that's ev team. everyone is so focused on just what did the paperwork say what did the agreement say right did they hit the dates that they were no what's interesting is glenn is trying to cut this off it sounds like before it even gets to like the nba board of governors right but but the right now the argument is about this really it should be a non-ambiguous contract did they did they hit the parameters and the markers that they were supposed to or not and that's where the fight is but to your point at the end of the day we've seen professional sports leagues there, it's it's a subjective process, right? Like right. if it's not if a, yeah, thirty exactly. NBA owners decide, you know what, you guys are we don't trust it. We don't trust that you have the funding, or we don't trust this or that. Right? They can decide that 
you're not going to own the Timberwolves. And we haven't even gotten to that phase of this yet. And that's where it's not a normal business. Like ordinarily, the next step would be, okay, let's just go to court. Well, the courts could could be like, you know what? Glenn violated every term of this contract and the league could say, we don't care. We we don't think th- these guys can join. It's a billionaire's club. Yep. And they, and yep. you know, they've got, they've got the password. They got the keys. They got the smoking jackets. They got the pipes. And if they don't want to put you in the billionaire's club, you ain't getting in. Yep. Okay. My last thing off the court, not as well, but I thought it was really, really cool. I don't know why. Uh, but sitting on the bench last night, obviously Carl Anthony Towns, who's hurt with a uh, Ricky Rubio jersey on. Throw a throwback one too. Yeah, I, I, props, cat. I I thought that was awesome. The guy great. loves. It's sort of a weird. Like at first, I'm like, what's he? What? What? And I'm like, oh, that that's cool. So props to Cat for representing a guy who, you know, at the end of the day, didn't have great success team wise here, but was but was sort of a foundational piece for a while. Was certainly beloved. I think his teammates loved him, obviously. It was very cool. I thought it was a cool tribute as well. And um, it definitely, I think it definitely fits the the Jersey theme of of our podcast and radio shows throughout the year too. A player who is, well, Rubio is older than Cat, right? So it's a player that's older than you, or yep. it's an ironic or fun Jersey of some kind. Just a nice tribute. So, yeah. And I don't know, maybe, maybe we, would, would we consider retiring Ricky Rubio's jersey just because of how popular he was and our lack of jerseys being retired inside that arena? Or is KG like the only one that crosses that? Well, threshold? KG, yes. KG for sure. Rubio, no. The interesting one is when, when he's done playing, do, do they pull the Kobe trick and retire one and five for Ant? Ooh, they could, yeah. I mean, Kobe I that. wore the two. And yeah. They retired both of them. Hey, on the KG front, something that really sucks throughout this, it felt like we were building toward K because KG has been he's been in contact with A Rod. He's been much more engaged on his podcast and social media, talking about the Timberwolves and Anthony Edwards and Cat. And it kind of felt like we were trending toward maybe KG sitting under the basket in that front row for like game one against the whoever they play in the first round. It feels like with Glenn Taylor pulling this power move and barring Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez from being around the team, that we just took a giant step back from getting KG in the good graces of the franchise. Oh, are right? you kidding? Yeah. Well, you know that, you know, as you told me on Saturday, I'm sure you're a thousand percent right. The guy that called A-Rod early on and said, get lawyers was KG. He was one of them. Yeah. And he's like, I don't need to get lawyers. Man. We're sitting at the kitchen table with Becky. You, it's you, man. It's a, you it's a problem. handshake over and now lasagna. And KG's like yeah. that. You know what? So, oh no, it definitely. <laughs> this is just another. I don't know what you call it, but this is just another bang into the potential relationship and KG coming <sighs> back. It just it's too bad. It's one of the most unfortunate things about this whole thing. And and look, I think as a Wolves fan. I think as a Wolves fan, Taylor might have done you a favor, but again, back to what you said, this is all Glenn's doing because he's the guy that signed these two up. Yeah. Uh, but I am very concerned about the future now. Like, what's the plan? That's the thing. And that's a it's whole like, other story. We don't know. There is still a chance that maybe there wasn't a great option between these two, but what's the third option? I still don't think the league would want this team. It's a top 15 media market. It's a passionate fan base. There's a superstar player here now. Attendance has been soaring over the last several weeks, months, right? Sure. Like they and they can get, you know, Bill Simmons laid this out on his podcast a few days ago by just adding two new teams, expansion teams in Seattle and Las Vegas, they can probably get 8 to 9 billion dollars total for those two franchises. Yep. So the like the NBA's first choice would be to keep a team in a top 15 market and then add Vegas and Seattle. 100%. So is the fear of an ownership group coming in here and moving the team as valid or is it just like a Minnesota thing where we always think that someone's going to leave us? It's not valid if we if we help out with a building. It's incredibly yeah. valid. That's what I keep coming back to. The building is the key. If yeah. if I don't care who buys the team, if a guy from you know, Los Angeles buys the team and immediately we say, okay, dude, we're going to build you a building. I think there's no fear. Yeah. If we say, Oh no, no, no. Which I'm fearful because of all the things we built now that we might and the political climate. That's what concerns me. I don't think attendance matters if you don't build a building. Yeah. 
No, I think I think it's funny because of course Glenn is like a, a Patrick Royce, he quoted him as saying like, hey, I love Target Center. It's great. We don't yeah. need it because he's he's like the least aspirational NBA owner. But, and if you believe what A-Rod said, too, on that Day Moore podcast, that he didn't even think we should reach out to Tim Connolly, that it, we'd just get embarrassed because people like that don't want to come here. So but Glenn is unfortunately and it's not surprising, I guess a Glenn is stumbling towards doing exactly what he was trying not to, to do, which is like he's 80 what? Two, 82. OK. So, like, his whole thing now is he's back in charge and he owns the team. I mean, unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, at his age, the clock is ticking. And so, if he passes, I don't think the Taylor family wants the team. Yeah. So, now we're talking about there. And and I don't know that the family is going to be like, let's make sure that this, that this gets done, that gets done. I think they're going to probably do what a family often does, which is say, let's sell this team. So That's what worries me. So, stay tuned, I guess. But to- anyway... Side I'm with down. you. A loss, but certainly not some type of terrible loss. Um, and I did think that the building, the fans were just great last night. Yeah. Love those fans. I think uh, so. The, the next time you'll hear from us on Flagrant Howls, uh, Kyle's out of town tomorrow. So I think because I'm going to the game tomorrow night, I was kind of hoping the Rockets would beat the Mavericks and bring that win streak into Target Center. They did have the 11 game win streak snapped by the Mavericks, but a red hot Rockets team coming in. I'll be there. I'll give you Phil's Wolves observations on on Wednesday. Then Jim Pete back in the mix later this week. They got the Warriors. Uh, or I'm sorry, no, they've um, they've got the Wizards coming up on their schedule. But there's some interesting games. Another game against the Nuggets. So strap in. And you know what, Glenn? Glenn, you and me, okay? Move Grady and Jim Pete back courtside now. Now or that you're give, back or, in charge, or give them the private room that you know Mark well, they, and Alex no, used to have. Both, but I'm saying move them back court. I have a feeling A Rod and Mark m- might have been like, we got to maximize more seats. Move them back court side, okay? They do deserve to be down there. Yes. Closer. Yes. So, all right. He's Judd. He's the sports dad for uh, Phil Mackey here and also Kyle and Ross, all of our friends on Flagrant House. This is a Timberwolves lifestyle podcast.